Hello and welcome to a DM's Guide to the Tomb of Annihilation. On today's episode, we're going to descend from level 3 and we're going to arrive at level 4, the Chambers of Horror. Level 4 is my favourite floor in the entire Tomb of Annihilation. So when you enter, you're going to enter Area 45, Gargoyle Guardians. And in this episode, we're going to go through 46, the Lizard Den. And we're going to continue along to the Elemental Cells at 47A, B, C and D. We'll then arrive at 48 Shimbagui's tomb. The reason why I'm doing this is these section of traps work almost like a Rube Goldberg machine. So when you activate 47, it works the whole way through 47, 48, and then you finally finish on 50, Mirror of Life Stealing. Let's begin. Error 45, Gargoyle Guardians. At the bottom of the grand staircase, a resident mechanical rumbling emulates from a dark shaft opening up in the middle of this chamber's floor. Four cylindrical stone pedestals surround the shaft, each 10 feet tall, 5 feet wide, and featuring a tiny slot in its side. Squatting atop each pedestal is a large four-armed gargoyle. If any character is looking at this from above, they see this. Each gargoyle is contained within a square made of metallic tiles embedded in the top of its pedestal. Starting in the northernmost pedestal and going clockwise, the tiles are copper, silver, gold and platinum. So you can see the map here, we have these four stars. So each of these represent the gargoyles. So from the north, we have copper, we then have silver, we then have gold and we then have platinum. So this trap is made to prevent your characters from rushing this tomb. So if they jump in from level level one and they fly the whole way down and if they leave this room without paying their fee they're going to be attacked by these four armed gargoyles. So these four gargoyles are standing atop effectively massive piggy banks. So in the north you see there's a copper plate on the top. That means if a character places a copper coin inside the gargoyle won't attack if it leaves the room. With the silver pedestal if they put a silver coin in there the gargoyle won't attack. And the same works for gold means a gold coin and platinum means a platinum coin. If your characters put platinum coins in all of them, it'll work. So for instance, if you put a coin of higher value of copper, it'll also work. How scary are these form gargoyles then? So with the giant form gargoyles, only a Serac knows the secret of creating these creatures. A giant form gargoyle stands between 8 to 9 feet tall and weighs roughly 5,000 pounds. It's typically employed as a tomb guardian, rending intruders with its fangs and deadly claws. So yeah, these gargoyles are no joke. They're challenge rating 10, and these gargoyles can definitely kill your entire party very easily. They have a massive amount of hit points, 147. They have a high armor class of 17. They have high strength, they have high constitution, and they're resistant to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing from non-magical attacks, not made with adamantium weapons. And the scary thing of all, they have five attacks in a round. So you get attacked by all four of their arms. You get four, four claw attacks, which deal an average nine points of slashing damage. And you do a bite attack that does 11 points of damage. They also have a very, very fast flying speed of 60 feet. So it'll be very unlikely for your characters to flee this encounter. So this is what the gargoyles look like. So they have the four massive arms, horns, and sharp teeth. And how would I play these then? Well, so you have your character here. So let's say they go into this room, they don't pay attention, and they leave. I would get all four gargoyles to attack that person. So the first person who goes out of this room without paying the fee will be attacked by all four gargoyles. And what they will do is they'll surround them. So they're large creatures, so it'll be quite tricky. For instance, if they go down this hallway that's 10 feet wide, they don't get squished. Same as over here, but if your characters are quick, they can go down these corridors here that are 5 foot wide. The large gargoyles can get it through, but they'll have disadvantage on attacks and advantage on hits against them. And the scary thing about these gargoyles is since they can fly, they can fly into the previous levels of the tomb and follow them throughout the entirety of it. So again, what will happen is I'll get the gargoyles to fly and get in contact with the character. And because they have 5 attacks, I'm going to get them to grapple so the characters can't run away anymore. And then i will get them to move the player character and I get as many any gargoyles to attack as possible. If you place this correctly, you could potentially get all four gargoyles to attack one character. And that means one character will have to take 20 different attacks. So this definitely has potential of killing a character. And also since there's four of them, they would have to destroy 600 hit points of health to destroy them all, which is not an easy feat. So my characters figured out the trap pretty quickly and they placed money in each of these massive piggy banks. I misread the book, so what I did was I made all all these gargoyles turned to dust as soon as the money went into the piggy bank. And that was a mistake on my part because as soon as the gargoyles fell apart, 
my party the looted what's inside. So what's inside these giant piggy banks then? So within the north pedestal, it holds five silver pieces and 100 copper pieces. On the east pedestal, it has one gold piece, 120 silver pieces and 200 copper pieces. In the south, it has two platinum pieces, 90 gold pieces, 350 silver pieces and 500 copper pieces. And in the west, it holds 10 platinum pieces, 630 gold pieces, 7,200 silver pieces and 5,000 copper pieces and the skeletal remains of an O'Malian engineer. And because of that, my party became immensely rich after that encounter. So you may ask, what's the shaft then? So what's in the bottom of the shaft in the middle of the room that's making metallic noises? Well, this is the entrance to level 5, Gears of Hate. And if your characters go down this shaft, it's 10 feet wide, 15 feet deep, and it opens into the ceiling of area 58. To scale the smooth walls of the shaft, a character needs climbing gear or magic. So just a quick synopsis. If your characters arrive here, they have to pay the fee in the cylinders below these gargoyles, otherwise the gargoyles will attack. If your characters pay the fee and then they attack the gargoyles anyway, the gargoyles will attack and defend themselves. So let me know in the comments below how your party got through this. Did they attack the gargoyles? Did they survive? Did a party member die? Let me know. And over here we have 7D and this is the final clue from a Serac. A Serac's fourth warning. Death to fire, dine or drown, precious air and falling sand. The army sleeps in silence, the mirror holds 12, Find the Iron Scepter's twin, the maze holds the key. So Death to Fire is for 47A, Diner Drown is 47B, Precious Air is 47C, and Falling Sand is the clue for 47D. The Army Sleeps in Silence is the clue for 40H Bagby's Tomb. The Mirror Holds 12 is the clue for Error 50 with the Mirror of Life Stealing. Find the Iron Scepter's twin is the clue for 52 and 53, the Crypt of the Sun Queen. The maze holds the key is the clue to area 55, Unk's Tomb, and he is the final trickster god in the Tomb of Annihilation. Let's go to area 46, the Lizard's Den. 46, Lizard's Den. A six foot tall green devil face is carved into the far end of this hallway. Its mouth agape, painted murals on the wall show faceless humanoid figures doubled over in pain, clutching their heads and ears. There's nothing dangerous in this hallway. The only thing is you have the six foot tall green devil face at the end of the hallway. Inside contains a lizard. This lizard was a recipient of an awakened spell cast by a Chaltian druid. As intelligence of 10 speaks Strudic, the company of the Yellow Banner used this lizard to set off traps. The lizard has escaped and has ended up here. So the lizard trapped in this mouth has no idea what happened to Yellow Banner. It's simply looking for a way to get out of the tomb. The lizard is a tiny beast, has an armor class of 10 and it has two hit points and it does one point of damage if it hits. So this creature is incredibly vulnerable. One thing I liked about this lizard was when my characters met it, they thought it was something more than simply a lizard. They became attached to it. The player who's playing a bard kept this lizard for the majority of the tomb. However, it was sadly killed by a Serac in the final battle. I liked Area 46 because it allowed to have a little bit of breathing room and you could have a bit of comedy effect with a lizard trying to speak to your characters using its hands and using sign language because not all characters speak druidic and if your characters don't have the spell comprehend languages it makes things very interesting. One thing about this hallway is that you have a secret door here that accesses 47 and this accesses 48 Shimbagui's tomb. The only way for this door to open here is for Weathers the custodian to open it manually and what he does is he waits for your characters to walk past, he opens the door and he tries to lure them in. He tries to get as many characters as possible to go into this room and he seals it and with area 47 each of these rooms is surrounded by an anti-magic field. So anti-magic field is an 8th level spell, a 10 foot radius invisible fear of anti-magic surrounds you. So in the case, the rooms are filled with this anti-magic field. Spells and other effects such as magic missile and charm person that target a creature or an object in sphere have no effect. Areas of magic, the area of another spell or magical effect such as fireball can extend into the fear. Any active spell or other magical effect on a creature or an object in the sphere is suppressed. Magic items such as a plus one long sword are now non-magical. Teleportation and planar travel fail to work in this sphere. Creature and objects, a creature and object summoned or created by magic temporarily winks out of existence in sphere. 
such as a Find Familiar spell. And finally, but not least, Dispel Magic does not work on this sphere. That's one mistake I made when I played this game. So once your characters get in here, they cannot use magic whatsoever. And once they get in, and Weathers thinks it's time, he's going to close the door and he's going to trap your characters in here. And this door has no obvious lock, so there's no way to get out except from following the puzzle. If your characters have a high perception, they can find this secret door, but they can't open it. That's my ruling anyway. Let me know if you had a different opinion when you played the game. So I've talked so much about Area 47, but let's begin properly. Area 47, Elemental Cells. 47A, the fire cell. Waves of heat blast out this cramped cell. The walls are scribed with relief carvings showing volcanoes setting cities ablaze. Rows of tiny holes are bored into the floor and the 10 foot high ceiling. A human skeleton embedded in the opposite wall holds an iron sconce with a burning red candle in it. As I said before, if Weathers is watching, he tries to trap as many characters as he can in the cell by whispering a command word that causes the secret door in the south wall to slide shut and lock. A wedge, spike, or similar object can be used to prevent the door from closing. But with the lava trap, molten lava begins to pour from tiny holes in the ceiling as soon as any character comes within one foot of the candle or removes it from the sconce. The lava rains down and magically drains away through holes in the floor. Each creature in the cell, when the lava begins to fill makes a DC 20 dexterity saving throw and taking 4d10 fire damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful save. And any creature in the cell for the first time on a turn or starts its turn in there must repeat the saving throw every turn. And because the cell's anti-magic field, magics and spells that provide resistance to fire offer no protection here. If the candle is extinguished from inside the cell, the anti-magic field is dispelled and all creatures in the cell are teleported to one of the other cells as follows. So let's see your characters cover this candle with water. The creatures in the cell are going to be teleported to the water cell in 47B. If the candle's flame is blown out, smothered, or scraped across the wall, creatures are teleported to the air cell in 47C. So let's say we have, we have two characters. So let's say this character here, she gets trapped in the room and... Your other part members outside, he physically can't get into this room, so he can't teleport because of the anti-magic field. This was a very good way to separate party. And let's say this character blows out the candle, they would teleport to here 47C, and if they cover the candle in water, they would teleport to 47B. The way I did it was, as soon as the character teleported out, this door opened again to lure in the next party member. But that's up to your discretion. When my party did this, three people went inside, we had one character left behind. It's very interesting for the three other characters, but the person who's left behind found it rather boring because they had to wait for this whole puzzle to unravel before he could do anything. As I said before, it works the Rube Goldberg machine, so once this sequence begins, it finishes over here in Area 50. Let's go to Area 47B, 47B Water Cell. You appear in a cell that smells mouldy, its damp walls are covered with living snails and oysters, and features sculptural reliefs of tidal waves destroying coastal cities and ships. A merfolk skeleton embedded in one wall clutches an iron sconce fitted with a burning red candle. Suddenly lukewarm water begins to pour into the cell through rolls of tiny holes in the 10 foot ceiling. So with this, I find this quite funny. The candle is a distraction and offers no way out of this cell. So the only way out of this cell is by eating the snails or oysters. So if you don't escape the cell, what happens is the water fills the cell at one foot per round, taking 10 rounds to fill the room. If the candle is left in its sconce, the rising water extinguishes it on the fourth round. Trying to stuff or block the holes doesn't stop the water from pouring in. And because of the anti-magic field, spells and magic items that enable characters to breathe underwater do not work here. Any character who runs out of air begins to suffocate. There are dozens of snails and oysters clinging to the walls. A character can use an action to remove an oyster or snail from the wall, crack it open and eat it. The first time an oyster or a snail is removed from the wall, the cell's anti-magic field is dispelled. If a character eats an oyster, it's teleported to the air cell of 47C, and if it eats a snail, it's teleported to 47D the earth cell. And when the last character leaves the cell, rows of tiny holes open the floor, allowing the water to drain at one foot per round. Two characters in here, in 47B, the room begins to fill with water. This character here, she eats an oyster, she's teleported to the air cell in 47C, and let's say he eats a snail, he's going to be teleported to 47D. So there's another way that this puzzle separates a party. So what happens in 47C? 
the air cell. 47C, the air cell. You immediately begin to choke as you're teleported to a room with no light, no sound, and no air. And because the cell's anti-magic field douses magical lights and non-magical flames are snuff out because of the lack of oxygen in the room, there's no light inside. So let's say your characters have dark vision. So let's say your dwarf or an elf. You can see this. Sculptured reliefs on the walls of this dark cell show tornadoes uprooting trees and tearing cities apart. An anarchora skeleton embedded in one wall holds an iron sconce bearing an unlit red candle. If your characters require air to breathe, they immediately begin to suffocate, the same as the water cell. Any character who cannot see can use an action to blindly search the cell by touch. If you make a DC 13 wisdom perception check, and the check succeeds, the characters discern one key feature of the room, either the wall carvings, the Arakora skeleton, or the candle. So what I did here was, when I explained the Arakora skeleton, I got them to make a nature check, because for who might know, birds have hollow bones, and that keeps them aloft when they fly, makes them very light. And because of this, an Arakora, who's a bird person, has hollow bones, and they contain still yet breathable air, each one a tube sealed with wax. Character with a dagger or similar tool can use an action to pry a bone out of the wall, pierce the wax seal, and inhale the air within. The first time a bone is removed from the wall, the cell's anti-magic field is dispersed, and any character who inhales the air is teleported along with her or his possessions to Area 48, Shimbagui's tomb. And again, with the unlit candle, it's simply a ruse to distract your characters so they don't think of the bones. So to go over the suffocating then, so a creature can hold its breath for a number of minutes equal to 1 plus its constitution modifier. When a creature runs out of breath or is choking, it can survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier minimum one round. At the start of his next turn, it drops to zero hit points and is dying and can't regain hit points or be stabilized until it can breathe again. So let's say that your character has a constitution of 14, that means it has plus two constitution. So that means it can survive for two rounds. If your character has 20 constitution, he's a mighty barbarian or a fighter, he can survive for five rounds. And in my case, you have a bard with eight constitution, they will die in one round. So with this puzzle here, your characters can suffocate and die very, very quickly. So let's look at 47D, the earth cell. 47D, earth cell. So before I explain what the room looks like, just a word of warning, if your characters get into this room, people might hate you afterwards. Just so you know, the walls of the stone cell are covered with reliefs showing desert sand swallowing the ruins of civilization. A base relief of a rolled medusa dominates one wall. It wears a stone necklace with an obsidian pendant and clutches an iron sconce with a burning red candle in it. Sand begins to fall from tiny holes burrowed into the 10 foot high ceiling. You hear a rumbling noise under the floor. So the relief is here, and under the floor contains a 10 foot deep pit that has two giant stone rollers with interlocking stone teeth. So think of a giant mincer. Any character who searches the cell succeeds on a DC 10 wisdom reception check, notices a seam that runs down the middle of the floor from north to south. This seems to suggest the assistance of a pen trap. If any creature who searches the Medusa base relief and succeeds in a DC 11 wisdom perception check, notices seams around the carving suggesting the presence of a secret door. A successful check also reveals the Medusa's obsidian pendant as a button. The button won't depress unless the pit is open. The character can try to unlock the button using thief's tools with a successful DC 17 dexterity check. And pressing the unlocked pendant causes the secret door to release with a dull chunk, after which the door can be swung open and reveal 48 Shimbagbu's tomb. However, the secret door has springs and it causes it to automatically close unless it's held or wedged open. So if your characters can't pick the lock, what happens then? Well, they have to wait until the room fills with sand. The falling sand fills the room at a rate of 6 inches per round, turning the floor into difficult terrain after one round. Your characters can reach the ceiling. Any character who can reach the ceiling can use an action to stuff the number of holes with cloth or wax, slowing the sand by one inch per round. When the sand reaches 12 inches, as in 12 rounds, the floor splits open. Half the floor swings down to the west, other falls down to the east. The sand starts falling, and a six inch wide ledge surrounding the pit and all side emerges. So if your character's standing on this ledge, they get advantage on a dexterity saving throw. If they're standing in the middle of the room, they have to make the check normally. 
So they have to make a DC 15 dexterity check, otherwise they fall into the mincer below. And this is why your characters will hate you. Anything larger than a grain of sand takes 24 d10 force damage, or 132 damage on a normal, 132 damage on average. I just can't wait to see your players' faces as you roll 24 d10s in front of them. Any creature reduces your hit points by this damage, is grown to a plump, and is killed. If any creature magically survives, they land below. They'll land an iron grate five feet below the grinders. A stone button is set into the walls above the grate, and you can only see it if you went through the trap. When you press the button, it causes the rollers to stop turning and it retracts into the walls. And if your characters have survived the horrible trap, they have to make a DC 15 strength check to see if they can climb back out again. And again, there's anti-magic field here, so spells and magical effects can't help them in this. When they climb back up, they can push the button and they can walk into Shumbagui's tomb in 48. So ladies and gents, I do apologize for finishing the episode on a cliffhanger. In the next episode, I am going to discuss 48 Shumbagui's tomb, and then I'm going to discuss 50 Mirror of Life Stealing, as this whole sequence is interlinked. Thank you again for watching. If you want to support the channel, there's a Patreon account in the link in the description below. I hope you're enjoying the series, and I hope you're having fun playing Tomb of Annihilation. And final shout out, I've got to say thank you again to Art of Shade for doing of the channel, the logo, and the thumbnail. So thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Ciao.